Something's happening. And it's, it's called corporate public relations, and that's what I want to talk about. It's an infestation of any notion of truth and of, 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 of journalism, and it has infected journalism, as William has so kindly and, and, and articulately pointed out. Um, in, in my job, if it, if it is a profession, I'm not sure that warrants the term, but I say you're getting along reasonably well, you get to, get to edit a local paper, you get a job on an evening on the Liverpool Echo, blah, 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 you're not doing all right, and if you really hammer away at it, you can sort of get to the 50 grand mark, as I, which if you, unlike me, if you haven't got uh, you know, an ex-wife and kids and things, is pretty comfortable, it's, it's fine. But if you want to, you can treble, quadruple that money, quintuple that money, by doing one of two things, working for Rupert Murdoch, or signing up to a public relations job with a big corporation. And the bigger the corporation, the bigger the money's going to be. Greystokes, forget it. You can have somewhere in Tuscany as well. I don't know. You, you can think big. It's all very easy. You just have to act with journalists as though you were one of the fraternity. We're all in this together. We're, 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 we're working on, you know, I'm a press officer, you're a journalist, and we'll go to many of the same clubs and parties and, and, and bars and we'll chat. The cops do it, the Metropolitan Police and some of what they call themselves crime correspondents. They were, we're all looking at the same thing here. Chaps, except the salary scale is radically different by this point. Their job is to work for whoever it is, the Department of Energy, Shell, Esso, Benetton, whoever you, you, you... You're not there to tell the truth. It's not Truth PLC who is paying your mortgage or your children's fees for private school. It's the corporation. Your job is to not answer the questions, if you like. Now, that doesn't mean you're always lying. It doesn't mean you're even being in that wonderful term that arose during the spycatcher trial in Australia, economical with the truth. Sometimes you may be telling the truth. But the point is, who's paying you and why are you doing it? Now, I, journalism doesn't really operate like that. I went into journalism went to work for a program called World in Action that some of you may be old enough to remember, with a sort of now almost quaint, naive idea that we were sort of there to cause trouble if necessary. Um, uh, those were the days when there was a lot of money around in television and you could actually pay people to sort of sit in the back of a boot of a car with a camera peeping out, waiting for some, for the chairman of British Steel to come out of his house, just to get a shot of him as he was closing down the steel industry. That sort of thing. It was considered our, 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 our job, really, because um, on the premise that the public relations wall was not going to tell the truth, and somebody had to, um, and, and it was going to be this sort of beleaguered, often rather self-satisfied, to be honest, sometimes arrogant bunch of people. Um, the, the, but but, but the, it seems that we shrunk in, in number and in intent while the PR bandwagon became sort of a, a, a more and more cogent presence in our society. Um, I'm going to leave Corrib for a while. Just talk. Another story I worked on was, uh, was the drug war in, in Mexico. I did a book about that. We won't go on and on about dr the drug war in Mexico, but... No, it's 100,000 dead, it's 20,000 missing. It's, 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 it's the first 21st century war because it's tied into the global economy that we're going to talk about at the end of this because that is very much what Corrib is about. And um, anyway, to, to cut a long story short, what happens to all the money? You can't drive around Mexico with a truck full of $350 billion spending it on leopards and private zoos and prostitutes and mariachi bands. You have to bank it. And to bank it, you have to find somebody who's prepared to do that. And they did. And it so happened that uh, that, that bank was uh, uh, called Wachovia, which is a subsidiary of Wells Fargo. Oh, for the internet, which has fully cooperated with the investigation. Thank you. Um, it's like the small print at the bottom of the drugs. You know, if you take too many of these, you will die. Kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, I have to say that. Um, and um, they got caught. Uh, it, it, I, I did the story at great length, interviewed the whistleblower, told me how he tried to, 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 to flag this up, was told by the bank to shut up and keep quiet, etc., etc. You ring the bank, we have no comment to make. So here's, here, is the, here is the equivalent in San Francisco of the gentleman, uh, um, well, that's not naming any names, 
Um, who's trebled, quadrupled, quintupled, multiplied the salary by 10 in the case of Wells Fargo, I bet, who was also an ex-journalist. No comment. No comment. $350 billion of drug money swilling through your bank and you've nothing to say? No, nothing. Next in line came HSBC. It turned out that the British-based biggest bank in Europe, the world's local bank, as they call it, was creaming off yet more of the Sinaloa cartel's money. This is the biggest criminal syndicate in the world. Um, whose leader was arrested recently. And, um, uh, uh, and they were, were quite coy at first when you called them up. Yes, oh, there is an investigation ongoing. They re concede reluctantly for a while. And when they finally get caught, their response is, is pathetic. Well, I'll characterise it and I'll get the, the exact um, things for you if I can find them, if I can find them quickly. Uh, it's... Um, Oh, we accept responsibility for past mistakes. We have said we are profoundly sorry for them, and we do so. We insist that HSBC is a fundamentally different organisation now. And on and on they go. In other words, uh, uh, incidentally, nobody goes to jail, nobody gets charged. The New York Times did actually report quite a, quite a, quite a for them, rather surprisingly accurate account of why no one was charged. Quote, Federal and state authorities have chosen not to indict HSBC, the London-based bank, on charges of vast and prolonged money laundering for fear that criminal prosecution would topple the bank and in the process endanger the financial system. No, no, can't have any of that. But then here's the rub. Here's the rub. What happens in the press? Well, you know, loony Ed Vogliani goes bonkers talking about these people being the financial wing of the Sinaloa cartel, etc. But here's the Financial Times, which people take much more seriously than they take me. <clears throat> Quote, Mexico had become a compliance nightmare for the HSBC. <laughs> ah, all those little brown people wandering around taking advantage of our good bank by throwing hundreds of billions of dollars. You know, they even made little boxes uh, that were just uh, small enough to fit through the, specially made to fit through the cashier's till in Mexico. Stuff with hundreds of thousands of, of dollars worth of cocaine and the profits of drugs, misery, murder. Remember the, um, the factory collapsed in Bangladesh? And all, I think uh, there was something like 1,200 to 1,300 people dead. One survivor, a girl aged, I think, 11. Um, Primark issued some hasty press releases going on about their wonderful new safety. No, actually before they were going on about their wonderful new safety measures in their factories. Um, but Benetton insisted uh, that none of the companies involved in the factory are suppliers to the Benetton group or any of its brands. Which is a bit strange because suddenly all these shirts started appearing in the wreckage with Benetton labels on them. So then along comes uh, uh, Biagio Chiaranzolanza who says that Oh, uh, that, that, that a one-time order had been uh, commissioned from the, from the factory in, in Bangladesh that, that, that uh, collapsed with only one survivor out of 1,400 or so workers. Um, but but, but that, it, that it had been, quote, several weeks prior to the building's collapse. And then more and more of these shirts started to ping, and there was a quick sort of, the, can you imagine the Benetton press office that morning, whoops, oh, it turned out that it had occasionally subcontracted to the, uh, to the, to the, um, to the Rana Plaza in Dhaka, Bangladesh, but that, quote, none of the factories inside the building was a supplier to any of Benetton's brands at the time of its collapse. So, you know, we're getting a sort of sense of what this game is. Um, and yet, when they're reported, when they go on television, when they're quoted in the press, it is as though they are talking objective truth. It is, it is as though I am telling you the situation with it at HSBC. I'm telling you the situation with the booze and the cops. It, I mean, whether it's, whether it's big or small, it's, it's, it's taken as fact. It's not. And we get to, I won't go on and on about this because you know it and Richard knows so much more than I do about this, but you get to the case of Shell in Nigeria. Amnesty International report, they tend to know what they're talking about, that amnesty isn't gospel, but they don't often get things wrong. Catastrophe in the, in the Niger Delta. Uh, and, and, and the Amnesty International commissioned a company called Acufacts, which is a, a consultancy, 
who concluded that uh, Shell had been, Shell's uh, investigations and reporting of its investigations into these catastrophic oil spills had been very subjective, misleading, downright false. Uh, pr the problem being that the evidence that does exist remains firmly under their control. I make absolutely no comparison whatsoever between what Mrs. Van Dam in The Hague was investigating at Belmont Police Station and the appalling situation in Nigeria. But, but, the, but, but, the, but, the, but the, the, the existence of the evidence under the control of the company doesn't change. Uh, some of the spillages were, quote, wrongly attributed to, to sabotage by the company, which reported Acufacts, quote, appear to be serving another agenda, more driven by politics and pipeline forensic science. This is a system that is wide open to abuse, and abuse happens. There is no one to challenge the oil companies and almost no way to independently verify what they say. In effect, it's trust us, we're big oil. So... That's kind of where we are. Is, 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 is this equation that they like to do between objectivity and neutrality? They're different mm. things. They're not the same. They are wrongly combined in our business. Mm. Objectivity is fact-specific. If one German worker is tragically killed on a pipeline, that's one German worker. It's not five, because I'm shelled to see, or none, because I'm shelled. It's one. When I was in Bosnia, if you go into a building and there are five charred bodies on the ground, it's five charred bodies. Not 12, because they're Serbs, or three, because they're Muslim, or whatever. Uh, that's objectivity. Objectivity is fact-specific. Neutrality is something else. It's a much more complicated notion. I'm not talking about the neutrality of Ireland or Sweden when Tony Blair and George Bush have lost their wits and gone into invade Iraq. That's another issue. I'm not talking about that. That is laudable. I'm talking about um, this idea of just sort of sitting back and let watching the scales go like this. Uh, after Bosnia, three years, traumatic years in Bosnia, I elected to go to testify at the war crimes tribunal in, in The Hague against a number of the war criminals. And I was said that I'd that I'd betrayed my objectivity. I said, no, I haven't. I'm going to just talk to the facts, but I am not neutral between a woman who is kept in a rape camp, violated all night, every night, and the soldiers who are doing it to her. I don't want to be neutral between those people. That's an extreme example. But I'm also not neutral between the, the farmer who I met less than an hour ago, who's trying to park his van in a through, by the, get, put his vehicle through the gate of his field, and the sergeant in the guard who comes up and says, get your car off the effing road. I'm not neutral between this, in that situation. I'm not neutral between the most beautiful shoreline in Europe and CCTV bright lights, thugs in uniforms, and, uh, and, and people filming uh, uh, children while they go to, 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 to swim in the sea. Or objectivity and neutrality, they're not the same thing. And I don't defend that. I mean, it goes, it, it's the huge and it's the small. If a skinhead is beating the shit out of an old lady and stealing a handbag on the street and you sit back and watch, you're not neutral, you're with the skinhead. In the, somebody, I read a, good, read a good book recently um, in which someone d d divides politics from political politics, party politics, horse trading, political, the things that affect our lives. <coughs> These things affect our lives. Um, we have, I think, and what we're talking about in this seamlessness between government, law enforcement, corporation and the fact that Alistair Campbell would do a great job working for, let's say, Texaco, and the press office at Texaco would do a great job working for the British Labour government. Um, it's interchangeable. It's this, we're all in this together, it's, let's chat about it as colleague colleagues. Um, there's a sort of global cartel capital government. I mean, it's, it's as though 
corporations had become a government irrespective of border. It's very mm -hmm. estimable of Scotland to be having this referendum, even if they have the guts to do it. How independent will they be, really? Iconographically, yes, and believe me, I, I, I have my views on, on, on this island um, uh, and its independence and, and the unity that is not. But, but we, we've got to think beyond that in this, in this next century. Ireland, Greece, opposite ends of Europe, in, in comparable, if not similar, situations. Um, multinational capital, the IMF dictating the terms more and more and more, um, and both of them at crucial points of their history. Greece is about to, this December, come to the 70th anniversary of the day the British Army opened fire on a crowd shouting Viva Churchill and armed the Nazi collaborationist militias to open on that crowd, thereby really beginning the Cold War but also the Greek Civil War. Here, the irony couldn't be more total, really. We're one year after the centennial of the lockout, we're two years before the centennial of the GPO, and here you are, it's as though Greece has somehow swapped uh, 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 the incoming British and thereafter American-backed junta and the colonels that terrorised that country and set up concentration camps, not only for the leftists, but also anyone who did not accept the national ideal. And um, your story, I don't need to, to talk about um, because you know it, but somehow in the shorthand, exit the tans, enter austerity and the multinationals and, and the rest. But then now I'm treading on dangerous ice, I should be <laughs> circumspect. It is irresistible though. Um, what puzzles me is how nobody seems to want to join the dots between this corporate presence, hegemony, as Gramsci would have called it, in our lives. Um, what a moment last night when O'Driscoll made his retirement speech when Ireland won the Six Nations. But he wasn't allowed to make it till a bloody great thing with RBS was out there behind him. RBS, the bank that gorged itself to death with greed, had to be bailed out by the taxpayer. They went on to pay 3.5 billion in fines for criminal activity in America. And on the BBC News it says that RBS has, has got to pay 3.5 billion. Oh, no, 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 you're paying the 3.5 billion, you silly mugs. But nobody actually says, well, I'm bringing that.